Miranda so much. Thank you, worship choir. Thank you, great choir. Thank you for praying today. We, uh, if you have a Bible, I hope you do, so we'll turn to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21 today. You'll be glad you're here for more reasons than one. This will be a very historic day in a lot of ways. We're covering a lot of verses in a special amount of time here, but it's okay. It's all right. Acts chapter 21 will be, I begin our study today in verse 17. We're going to talk about defending the faith. Defending the faith. You know, Simon Peter has written in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Some words I want you to hear. Now you're in Acts. I just want you to listen to 1 Peter 3. 13 for a moment. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Well, one, one story to focus on with that is those Coptic Christians, those are our brothers and sisters in Christ in Egypt on the way to a prayer meeting when people with guns opened up fire on them and killed them. So, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? You have to tie that back into our prayer time today with Romans 8. Verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ. The Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, um, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. You see, we're to be able, Peter says, to honor Christ, the Lord is holy, in our hearts, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that's within us. One thing we have, no matter what happens with injury or sickness or death, or loss of job, or persecution, or reviling that may come our way is, if we are true believers, we have hope that cannot be taken away. Yes, we will weep. Yes, we will cry. In fact, the Bible teaches us we, re we rejoice with those who rejoice, and we weep with those who weep. We've done that this morning with Philip Robinson and his family as we made this great prayer circle and prayed. As we prayed for Miss Jackie Davenport and for Madeline Stewart. And as we prayed for Bill King and James Flowers and Virginia Abrahamson as they recover from sicknesses and surgeries and illnesses. As you pray for your children, as Miss Miranda sang in her song, we pray for blessing. We pray for protection. We pray for Prosperity, not meaning money and riches, but the prosperity that comes through knowing Christ and walking with Christ. The world in which you and I live, the more that we reflect Christ to a lost and dying world, the more the persecution we will experience. And yet God says, defend the faith. Tell others the good news. We're in a journey in the book of Acts, which will end later this summer. But Acts is the unfolding story. And I love this. Acts is the unfolding story of the people of God, filled with the Spirit of God, engaging in the mission of God. Let's not forget two mission teams today. We have one in Atlanta and one in Guatemala right now that are God's people on mission, and they will accomplish squat if they aren't filled with the Holy Spirit of God, energizing them as they do what they're doing today on this Sunday in Guatemala and in Atlanta. And so is it with you and me as we go back to school on Tuesday, as we go to work later today or tomorrow or Tuesday, as you go to the beach or to the gym, as you go to a restaurant for lunch today or whatever it may be. We're to be the people of God filled with the Spirit of God, engaging in the mission of God. We don't have a weekend off as Christians. You do understand that. So if you are at the beach working on a tan and working on your swim strokes or whatever it might be, enjoying some leisure, that is fine. 
but you're still on mission. We're always on mission. We never get time off. Satan never takes a moment off. Neither can we relinquish our mission and ignore the calling that God has placed on us. And so uh, this is what you call Holy Spirit adjustment. But anyway, Acts chapter 21, verse 17. Let me begin reading. And I want to read until I stop. All right? Acts 21, verse 17. When we had come to Jerusalem, here we have Luke, who's writing this, of course, and Paul and the, the team of, of missionaries and supporters from Caesarea. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, the leader of the church, and all the elders were present. And after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. And when they hear it, they're going to cause trouble. That's what he's saying. All right. Verse 23. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles, this is what we studied back in Acts 15, Jerusalem uh, Council. Notice what they said for Gentiles like you and me getting saved. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, uh, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them, and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled, and the offering presented for each one of them. Now, what you have here is Paul and his group getting to Jerusalem. They meet with the church. Uh, they, they, experience, they experience fellowship together. Uh, the leaders of the church expressed concern about something they had heard about Paul, which was not true, but nevertheless, he was a concern floating about false information being shared amongst some of the brethren, actually a lot of the brethren, and so they proposed a solution. Paul has been in Gentile country as a missionary for a long time now. He's been doing missionary work for about 20 years. And so they say, hey, what you ought to do now that you're back home in Jerusalem here is you ought to go to the temple and you need to purify yourself. And why don't you go ahead and pay the, the fee for these four guys to be purified and go through their uh, sacrifices of purification and all of that. And that way, when, when the Jews who are saying things about you that aren't true see you following the customs of Moses, they'll be put to shame. Those who are reviling you will, will be put to shame because it's obvious you're not against Jews practicing the cultural habits of Judaism. It, it, it's not a problem. And so this is what Paul does. So with humility and a desire for unity, Paul then agreed to the elders' proposal. And Paul's participation in this ceremony is it, it, kind of a living demonstration of 1 Corinthians 9. Where Paul says that I will become all things to all people that I, might, that I might by all means save some. I'll be a Jew among the Jews. I'll be a Gentile among the Gentiles. Right? Uh, that's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says in verse 23 that I do it for the sake of the gospel. So for the sake of the unity of the church of God's people. The Jewish group and the Gentile group. And for the, the sake of unity and for the purity of the church. And for the power and the purpose of the gospel to go forth. Right? Paul agrees, and he, so he takes these four men, and they go to the temple. Now notice in verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is what I think of citizen arrest, Barney Fight, right? You know, they, they see him over there, and they start hollering out, right? Let's arrest him, let's arrest him. This is the guy we were telling you about over lunch. Over that kosher little bagel we were having. I want to see what I was talking about. That's him. Right there. Let's get it. Crying out. Men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone, everywhere, against the people and the law and this place. Teach them against the temple. That's what they were saying. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up. And the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And at once the gates were shut. Because there's 
problem, storm brewing. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. That's the Romans, by the way, all right? The Roman army, army officer. He at once took soldiers and centurions, remember those are the sergeants in the group, and ran down to them. And when they, uh, and, and when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So they, they were tearing him up, all right? They were going after old Paul. Uh, then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. So they took him back up to Fortress Antonio with them. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed and cried out, Away with him! All right. So it was a serious situation. Now, let, let me say this. This passage marks a major turning point in the book of Acts. Obviously, we're getting close to the end of the book of Acts now. And previously, Paul had been free to travel. Ever since God converted him on the road to Damascus back in Acts chapter 9, Paul was free to travel, come and go at will, except for brief imprisonments like he had, like he had at Philippi back in Acts chapter 6. He was in prison that night. Remember, then the earthquake came and they got out and the jailer got saved. Remember that story, Acts 16? So Paul basically had been a free man. But from this point on in the book of Acts, Paul is now... A prisoner. But his arrest did not end Paul's ministry. Now, no longer free to travel at will, Paul became what he describes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20, as an ambassador in chains for Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? He's now an ambassador in chains for Jesus Christ. What we just read in verses 27 through 36 basically is this. Paul was attacked by the Jewish mob, stirred up by false information. It was not true at all, right? They had seen Trophimus with Paul. They supposed he'd take them in the temple. Paul would never do that. That was against the, the custom of the day. But that, that's what they supposed. So they spread false rumors. They stirred up a rioting mob that were attacking Paul and about to kill him. So Paul was attacked by a mob and then he was arrested by the Romans. That's what we have seen so far. Now, what I want you to jot down this morning is this. We should persevere in the midst of all circumstances because we can trust God's plan. We should persevere in the midst of all circumstances because we can trust God's plan. That's, that's the big truth I want you to really get. I have two. I had three. I'm down to two. We are to keep on keeping on in the midst of all circumstances because we can trust God's plan. Now, if you don't write that down and memorize it and then take some scripture and fortify the faith within your heart, that will be hard to live out when something takes the floor out from under you. That's what God is trying to do to us today through our special prayer time with Brother Philip and his family, special music we've had. He's trying to fortify our faith. There's something I put on Facebook this week as I was studying. Dr. Jerry Rankin actually said this. I heard him at Bellevue Baptist Church years ago when he was the president of the International Mission Board. Dr. Jerry Rankin said, being in the center of God's will is not always the safest place. But it's always the best place. Being in the center of God's will is not always the safest place, but it is the best place. What I would draw from us from verses 27 through uh, 36 would be that, that you and I need to persevere in the midst of hardship, whatever that might look like. We need to persevere in the midst of suffering, whatever that may look like. That can be your own body. It can be the loss of a job. It can be the people mock you, revile you uh, because you follow Christ. Uh, it, it could be that your children are in a stage of rebellion at this point in their lives. It could be uh, that, that a wife or a husband has walked out. It could be that your kids no longer speak to you. That is suffering and hardship. And when we suffer for righteousness' sake, we are blessed, Peter said. I also want to show you this from Matthew 5. And because of time, I was going to have you. If you want to grow, you got to go. But we don't have time. Uh, but it's okay. Um, we shifted some things to, to make time for the other, and that is fine. I'll live with that. Matthew chapter 5, in the Beatitudes, Jesus said this in Beatitude number 8. Matthew 5 and verse 10. 
Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That's like saying um, merry persecution, happy persecution. Happy, the word blessed there, blessed, means, makarios, means happy. That's what it means. Happy or blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so those who were on their way to prayer meeting and were ambushed, and those Coptic Christians a few years ago, those young men who were on the shore of the sea and on their knees in those orange jumpsuits and they were asked to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ and they refused. And they were beheaded for their faith in Christ. There is a reward greater than anything this earth could ever offer them in that moment of time. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, church, we have to have our faith fortified. We have been living in Disney World uh, of Christianity in America, and that, that is no longer the case. But we're not where they are in Asia today, or in Africa today, or in the Middle East today. We don't have even the threat that is there in Europe today. But brothers and sisters, that threat will come our way. I believe that. Times are going to get darker and harder. And, and we have to be Built up in the faith. Do we want that? No, nobody wants that. But that is a reality. The Bible has been prophesying, promising that for years and years and years. And we, we kind of shrug it off because we live in America. And we have it easy. We have clean drinking water. We have 911. We have pharmacies that are open 24 hours a day. We have food places open 24 hours a day. And I have been spoiled. I dare say in America we all have. In, the, in North America we all have. And we must persevere when hardship comes. And as the lead singer in Mercy Me in the video said, it, it, it will come to you in some shape, form, or fashion. It always does. It always will. And what do we do? We have to keep on. We can trust God's plan. Jesus said, blessed are you when others revile, speak evil of you, and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil. They speak evil things about you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When you're being persecuted, you are in good company. That's what Jesus is saying. You say, well, that's Jesus talking. I mean, man, you know, he's, he's the Son of God in human flesh. Well, if you look back at Acts chapter 5, and we, we preached this when we were there, but let's just reference it again today. Acts 5, 41, 42. The, Peter and the apostles were preaching Jesus. They'd been told not to by the Jewish authorities. They were beaten, flogged. And Acts 5, 41, then they left the presence of the council, that's the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day, and they hushed and they quit doing that, every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus, that the Messiah is really Jesus. They didn't quit. And so there you've got people like you and me put their bridges on just like you and I do. They're not God in human flesh. They're men who have faith in God. Who stayed strong. And they rejoiced when they were counted worthy to suffer for the sake of the name of Jesus. Romans 8, 28. <laughs> and we know that all things work together for those who love God, for those who have been called according to His purpose. We read that in our prayer time today. Romans 8, 28. Listen to me. I think you all know me well enough to know I, am not, I have no cape under my shirt. I am far from Superman. I sin. I mess up. I blow it. I worry. I have fears and anxiety that I have to confess on a regular basis. But what this message today is as much for me as it is you and any other Christian in North America or around the world for that matter. We need to have a faith in our God who is an awesome, mighty, saving, sovereign, reigning God. In Mark 9, 24, I thank God for that verse. Where the Father said, I believe, but help my unbelief. I need to believe more. It's hard when you see your baby hurting him. 
It's hard to see your loved one, your spouse of all those years getting weaker and weaker and struggling to breathe and, and, and unconscious or not knowing who you are. All those things that happen in a Genesis 3 world, they will come for you and for me in some shape, form, or fashion. Every one of them, from crib death to dying in a nursing home, people are going to suffer in this world because of human sin. And we must persevere in the midst of all circumstances. Why? Because we can trust God's plan. If I don't have that, I have nothing. What I'm doing is a sham. It's a fake. It's a show. I'm going to tell you, I believe it. Sometimes I struggle like you do, like the Mercy Me lead singer does. That's just being real, like he said. We all struggle at times, but brothers and sisters, we need to struggle together. We need to participate in biblical community. And we need to persevere in the midst of all circumstances because we can trust God's plan. And then the third thing, and I know I've got to push this one. We should persist in proclaiming the gospel because we fulfill God's purpose. That's why we're here. We should persist in proclaiming the gospel because we fulfill God's purpose. That's what happens here in Acts 21, uh, verse 37. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, hey, Do you know Greek? <laughs> Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt, led the 4,000 men, the assassins, out in the wilderness? Paul said, No, that's not me. Uh, Paul replied, I'm a Jew, man. I'm not an Egyptian. I don't walk like an Egyptian. I'm a Jew. <laughs> All right? Uh, I'm from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, now check this out. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, now here's what you got to see. There are three elements of a good testimony. And this is what I want to leave you with today, all right? There are three elements of a good testimony. What we're going to see here in Acts 22 is Paul sharing his testimony with these people, all right? Let me ask you, what's your conversion story look like? That's an important question. What's your conversion story? What's your testimony of salvation? You ought to rehearse it in your mind right now because there will be people in this room that don't have one. I was in Bible school to teach and pray for all of us to be saved. That's not you getting saved. But I go to church as often as I can. That's not you getting saved. But I was at, I was at uh, one day. I was at youth camp. I was at, you know, a college conference. I was... Did God save you? Every Christian has a conversion testimony. Paul is sharing his. There are three parts of it. Three elements of a good testimony. Number one, jot this down. What was your life like before meeting Jesus? What was your life like before meeting Jesus? That's what Paul does in verses one. Uh, that's what Paul does in verses one through five of Acts twenty-two. Acts twenty-two one to five. Paul is describing his life before his, he met Jesus. Right. Look at verse three. He says again to the people now, not to the Roman soldier, but to the people. Not to the tribune, but to the people. All right. I am a Jew. He stepped on, he stand on these stairs going up to the fortress Antonia, and down here's all these rioting Jews. They quiet him down, so now he hollers out to them. I'm a Jew, like you, all right? I was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but, but brought up in this city. I was educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted the Christians, called the way. I persecuted this way. To the death. And he enjoyed it. Binding and delivering them to prison. Both men and women. As the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. The Sanhedrin knows it. I used to beg them for permission to go arrest and beat and kill the followers of Jesus Christ. The followers of the way. That's what he's saying there. From them I received letters to the brothers. And I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem. That way he's going to chain them up, bring them to Jerusalem to be tried and convicted and punished or killed. As I was on my way, 
and drew near to Damascus. About noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered him, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am, and this is what he wasn't expecting to hear, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told all that's appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. Verse 12. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, he came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. You will be a witness for him to everyone uh, of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise. Come on, Saul. Rise up. Get up, man. Be baptized. And wash away all your sins, calling on his name. So trust in Christ and go get baptized, he says. Here you see element number two. See, element number one, what was your life like before you met Jesus? Number two is this. How did Jesus change your life? This is point number two. How did Jesus change your life? That's what Paul is sharing here. How Jesus changed his life. How Jesus saved him and changed his life. And you need to share the circumstances of when Jesus saved you. That's what you do in point number two. You share the circumstances of when Jesus saved you. And, jot this down. I can't go into depth on this part. It's important. But this is where you tell them the gospel. You tell them the gospel in point number two. That's what you do. You say, well, I don't know that. Then we need to learn that. That's one of our big focuses here at Crawford Baptist Church is that everybody from our children and our youth and our college and our adults, we know what the good news is. If you really believe it, I believe you're going to know it. You may have to work at telling other people that, but you're going to know the gospel, the good news of how God has saved you in Jesus Christ. All right, number three, the third part, jot it down. We're going to read it out and we'll be done today. Third one is, how is your life changing? How is your life changing from when you met Jesus until now? How is your life changing from when you met Jesus until now? So, what was your life like before you met Jesus? Right? Number two, how did Jesus change your life? And then number three, how is your life changing? Uh, changing. How is your life changing from when you met Jesus until now? Because, you know, if you, if, you, if you truly got saved 50 years ago, you're not the same man or woman. You're just not. He's working in you, always making you more like Himself. And so, Philippians 1, 6, He who began the good work will continue that good work on the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, notice what Paul said. This is the life after meeting Christ. Verse 17. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him as Jesus saying to me, Make haste. That means go quickly, right? Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And with the blood of Stephen, your witness was being shed. I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. He, he, he was supervising the, the, the martyrdom of Stephen, the execution of Stephen. Verse 21, And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. What you see there is simply Paul recounting, This was my life before Christ. Man, I studied under Gamaliel. I was, man, I studied under the strictest of the teachers of our law. I knew it inside and out. Go to Philippians 3. Man, I was, I was climbing the ladder of Judaistic success. I was the star of Judaism. I was on my way on a special mission to arrest Christians, and Jesus arrested me. And He saved me. And He transformed my heart. The one whom we all had killed is alive. And He's forgiven me. And He now actually lives in me. And He'll never die. And I can never really die. Even though you killed my flesh, I still am alive in the Spirit. 
to be absent from the body. I mean, who's the one who wrote that? <laughs> to be absent from the body is to be present with Jesus. So you can't stop me. You're not going to stop him. And then he shares about what Jesus has been doing in his life from his moment of conversion. He used to arrest Christians. Now he goes out sharing the gospel to see God save people and make Christians. And so as we close today, you did real good. I thank you for listening so quickly. That's a lot of verses, whether you realize it or not. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Are you participating in biblical community? Are you participating in biblical community? We have great opportunities on Wednesday night in our young adult Bible study, uh, our moms and prayer group. Those are small group Bible studies and prayer times. We, we have... Uh, of course, our Sunday morning community groups. We have one that meets on Sunday night. Our college community group meets on Sunday nights. Works better for them. But are you in biblical community? If you're not, I have a list of those up here on my front chair. Love for you to come pick one up. Those are our Sunday offering community groups. I know that can be difficult. You don't maybe know the people right off in there, but they'll be friendly. They'll welcome you. You know, to grow as a Christian, you need a community group. Number two, are you keeping on keeping on trusting God's plan? Are you keeping on keeping on? Trusting in God's plan. <coughs> As a shepherd of you, I, I know many of you, and you walk through some different times. And some of you I don't know as well as I would really like to. So another reason we have biblical community groups so that those shepherds can get to know you. Because I can't know 400 people too well, but I know I, I, I know many of you, and I know many of your circumstances in which you've gone through, or what you're going through. And I'm going to tell you, trusting God's plan is not always easy. That's why we need God's word. We need God's people. Are you keeping on keeping on by trusting God's plan? Number three, are you fulfilling God's purpose by sharing the gospel? Every one of us as a Christian, if we are saved right now, then we are a missionary to tell somebody else about Jesus. Are you fulfilling God's purpose for your life by sharing the gospel with unsaved people? And then the fourth question I had to end with is, do you have a conversion testimony. Do you have a conversion testimony? You know, the Bible teaches when you compact the Scriptures and look at it, that the, the just and gracious God of this universe, the one who made it all, looked out upon hopeless and sinful people. You know, when you see a mess, a lot of times you turn and walk from it, don't you? Have you ever walked into your children's room and said, oh, dear Lord, and turned and walked right back? <coughs> You'll get there. <laughs> I don't want to tackle that one. I hope Mama finds that one. <laughs> God saw the mess, and he came right at us. He became one of us <clears throat> to win us out of it. See, the gospel is the good news of the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopeless and sinful people. That's all of them. Nobody beyond the reach of God's redeeming grace. That was the theme of our community group this morning in our Zacchaeus lesson. We should not look at anybody as unreachable by God because one day somebody could look at you and say, hey, boy, she looks unreachable. She's wealthy, got an all together, got a good job, got money, got cars, got vacations lined up for the next three years. She won't need Jesus. She wouldn't trust Jesus. Oh, we look at the guy in the gutter and his vomit and alcohol and drug addiction. Man, he's beyond God's reach. Listen, the, the Bible that we studied this morning said, hey, don't look at anybody as being beyond God's reach. The wealthy are not beyond God's reach. The poor are not beyond God's reach. The drug addict, the alcoholic, the man who lives in his own vomit because that's just his lifestyle regularly is not beyond God's reach. We're to reach out to the mercy. And so the just and gracious God of the universe looks upon hopeless and simple people sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to bear His wrath against our sin on the cross and to show His power over sin by resurrecting Jesus' dead corpse from the grave so that everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord will be reconciled to Him forever. The gospel is good. The gospel is how we begin today in our singing. The gospel is how we end now. And today, if you need Jesus... You can cry out to Him. Everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Our other pastors are on mission trips, but I can tell you, I'm here. And if you need to come and pray with somebody, I'll be here. My wife Pam is here at the party. Let me pray with some of the women if you want to come about some issue going on. If you need prayer, you need some grace, you come and get it. And grace is available. 
It's only unavailable to you if you have pride and won't receive it. That's the only thing. God resists the pride, by the way. But He gives what? Grace to the humble. You know that verse? Let's pray. Let's let our musicians take their place. Father, thank you for a powerful morning. Thank you for the special prayer today. Thank you for uniting these brothers and sisters in Christ together for the cause of prayer. And God, now as we respond to your grace that we experience through song, through testimony today, from Mrs. Adams, in your special prayer time, and from your word and the sermon, God, we, we want to respond to you. I pray, God, you'd save people. I pray, God, that you'd open blind eyes and give life to spiritually dead people. Lord, help people see that they were created to know you, God, and to worship you and rejoice in you. That no matter what comes in this life, nothing can separate from the love of God. For those who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord, God, help us, Lord. Lord, just help us to be responsive to the Spirit of God now. I ask you to move as we sing and worship you in our response. In Jesus' name. Let's stand.